Hello everyone, a very good afternoon and welcome to the Nobel Prize Dialogue Singapore 2022. Nobel Prize Laureate Lecture by Professor Serge Harosh. I'm Arpit from Graduate Students Club of NTU School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences. It is my esteemed honor to be the MC for today's lecture. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Nobel Prize Organizing Committee for bringing the Nobel Prize Laureate Lecture to Singapore and to the Institute of Advanced Studies at Nanyang Technological University for organizing this event. We are happy to welcome our audience here at the SPMS Lecture Theatre One. To begin with, I would like to invite our guest of honor, Professor Ling San, Deputy President and Provost Nanyang Technological University to deliver his welcome address. Professor Serge Arroche, um, Nobel Prize Laureate in Physics. Is this working? Can you hear? Okay. His Excellency, Mr. Marc Abonsou, um, Ambassador of France to Singapore, uh, Ms. Uh, Laura Spachmann, um, CEO for Nobel Prize Outreach, and colleagues, um, students, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Serge Arroche um, to deliver today's Nobel Prize Laureate Lecture at Nanyang Technological University, NTU, Singapore. This lecture is part of the inaugural Nobel Prize Dialogue Singapore 2022, titled The Future We Want Together, which was launched at the Raffles City Convention Center yesterday. And for those of you from uh, outside of NTU, well, welcome to our rather green campus. Professor Serge Arroge, Professor Emeritus at Collège de France, has made outstanding contributions to the field of cavity quantum electrodynamics. He's renowned for his pivotal experimental methods that enable the measurement and manipulation of individual quantum systems and involve the, the study of subatomic light particles known as photons. For a long time, fundamental problems such as photons, uh, fundamental particles such as photons, were difficult to isolate from the environment they're in without destroying many of the mysterious properties, um, the quantum properties that physicists uh, actually seek to understand. Since the 1980s, Professor Serge Arroche has designed ingenious experiments to study quantum phenomena when matter and light interact. Motivated by curiosity and the challenge to probe the atom-photon interactions processes at the most fundamental level, he worked on creating a trap for light particles uh, or photons by using ultra-reflective mirrors cooled to an extremely low temperature of nearly minus 273 Celsius or absolute zero. The device allowed him to manipulate and measure the quantum state of individual atoms as they pass through the trap. The innovative work which allows quantum particles to be conserved and studied won him the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics. And that was jointly with Professor David Weinland, who independently developed traps for electrically charged atoms or ions. Until 20 years ago or so, their incredible experimental tests were the fantasies and dreams of quantum physicists. The groundbreaking work has opened a path to new technologies that were unimaginable in the past, such as superfast quantum computing and quantum communications. Well, Professor Arroge has always been a fervent supporter of education. He has engaged our researchers and young students in science across a wide range of topics. In fact, in 2012, just a few months before he was awarded the Nobel Prize, um, he was right here in Singapore, where he gave <clears throat> a few lectures at the Singapore School of Sciences, an initiative of the Institute of Advanced Study, IAS, at NTU. And in January 2016, he returned to, to, to deliver 
a public lecture at a joint event organized by the IES and the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics. And that was on the topic of quantum information processing. So today, we are truly honored to welcome him back here at NTU, Singapore, to speak to our students and our young researchers about the fascinating relationship between the so-called useless and useful science. To the young and budding scientists in our midst, I hope that today's lecture will enable you to learn more about the state of the art development and trends in quantum physics and be inspired to appreciate basic and applied sciences from a new perspective. So in closing, I'd like to thank the Nobel Prize Dialogue Organizing Committee for bringing the Nobel Prize Laureate Lecture to Singapore and also to the IES for organizing this event. So may we all sit back and be inspired this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ling San. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Laura Spurchman, CEO for Nobel Prize Outreach to the Rostrum for welcome remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lin San, dear Nobel Prize laureate Serge Haroche, His Excellency Ambassador of France, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all, dear students, and I much look forward to this lecture. I will not further introduce Professor Haroche. I, will, I would rather leave you all the time you need to commence your lecture. I just want to say that uh, Nobel Prize Outreach is, is honored to organize this. Our task is to spread all the knowledge and inspire young people around the world based on the Nobel Prize and with the presence of our dear Nobel Prize laureates. We want to stimulate you to be curious to ask new questions and uh, to discover how fascinating it is to go into the field of science, of humanities, or uh, dedicate yourselves to peace work to hopefully make this place, this world, a bit better. So with that, as you know, we organized the Nobel Prize dialogue here in Singapore yesterday about well-being, about what we can do to improve our well-being. And um, if you're interested, you can find uh, lots of material on that online. With that, I would like to thank and to you and um, the opportunity to being with us here today and uh, enjoy the lecture. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's time. Please welcome Professor Harosh for his lecture, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Litsan, for this very kind and uh, very uh, deep introduction. And thank you, Laura for having invited me here to Singapore and having allowed me to attend a very interesting uh, meeting yesterday with very thoughtful discussions with students about well-being. And uh, this gives me also the opportunity to talk to you about science today here at NTU. As has been mentioned, I, I have been visiting Singapore many times, and NTU in particular, and I'm always glad to come back here uh, each time I see a lot of changes, so it's, uh, it's really a, a city and a state which uh, uh, evolves all the time and which is submitted to a very strong acceleration, and I see uh, this each time I come back here. Uh, you see the, ti the title of my talk uh, has certainly uh, 
made you guess that I will be talking about the connection between basic and applied science. And I thought it was appropriate to talk about this here because in NTU you have the letter T, which means technology. And I'm sure that you're all aware that technology cannot go without basic science at the start. So I don't want to convince you, I'm sure I don't have to convince you about that, but I think it's interesting to reflect on the history of the connection between basic science and application because it, gives, it will give us some hints about what we can expect in the future by looking at the past. So the first question that I, which is quite clear when you talk about science is why uh, scientific research? And usually you have two complementary answers. The first one is that we want to satisfy our curiosity. We want to understand the world around us and this is the Anglo-Saxons are calling that often blue sky research, which is appropriate because, for instance, try to understand why the sky is blue is something which is related to literature, to art, but one may think that it has no direct practical application, which is, which is wrong, by the way, as we will see. The second answer is, of course, uh, let me see what is the second answer, yes. Uh, is of, of course to, you, to invent useful and marketable devices, hopefully devices which will bring uh, financial assets and which will uh, be useful for the economy. And this is called applied research. And uh, usually uh, governments and private companies favor this short term usefulness and consider curiosity as a kind of luxury, especially in time of economical hardships. So a lot of money goes to apply the research, but it is hard to convince uh, governments and political uh, responsible people uh, to give a lot of money to basic science. What uh, I want to explain here and to justify by examples is that history tells us that, sh that this is a short-sighted uh, view uh, blue sky research and technologies go in fact hand in hand and it's very difficult to dissociate them from one another and it goes both ways. Basic science is useful for technology and technology of course helps uh, basic science to progress. So uh, in fact I must confess that the title of my talk is not original. I borrowed it from uh, a small book which had been written by Abraham Flexner, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge Abraham Flexner was the first the founding president of the Princeton Institute of uh, Advanced uh, uh, of Advanced Studies, and uh, he was not a scientist by himself. He was more like a, a science educator, a science manager, but he had a very clear view of what science was about and of the connection between basic and applied science. And of course, what he wrote in this book uh, is something which, that all scientists agree about. For instance, he gave examples. He said, everybody, some people think that Marconi invented uh, radio broadcasting, but in fact, the real inventor was Hertz, and Hertz was a basic scientist who wanted to prove Maxwell's that Maxwell's equations were right, and he was the first one who made uh, a, a source of radio waves and detected radio waves. Marconi was just a kind of engineer which made this, uh, become this, the, the, this uh, system become practical. And he gave many, many other examples. And of course, all scientists agree about that. And on, on this slide, I will quote another uh, person which, who was a real deep scientist, Heinrich Casimir, was one of the founder of quantum physics. He was very young in the 1920s, but he contributed to the emergence of quantum physics, and he's the one who introduced the notion of quantum vacuum. And the Casimir force is a force which is exerted between two metallic plates due to vacuum fluctuation between them. And this notion of vacuum fluctuations has become even more important in modern physics because it's, it's something very important in cosmology. This vacuum is permeating all space and the properties of this vacuum are essential to understand uh, the cosmologic, uh, 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 cosmo cosmologic physics and the origin of the universe. But Casimir was also an applied physicist. And in fact, during the 1960s, he was the CEO of the Philips Laboratories, which are labs which developed 
uh, lightning and, and also, uh, of course, a lot of electronic devices. And he wrote the following statement. I have heard statements that the role of academic research in innovation is slight. It is the most blatant piece of nonsense that it has been my fortune to stumble upon. I think there is hardly any example of 20th century innovation which is not indebted to basic scientific thought. So this is what I would like to illustrate today. Uh, Casimir was thinking about uh, 20th century physics. It's also true about the 21st century physics, as we will see. But I would, would like to start by uh, reminding us of uh, the fact that science is uh, fundamentally and has been history driven by curiosity. And I uh, will just summarize on this slide very quickly the great discoveries about light and matter. Fundamental questions about light have triggered the curiosity of physicists. The question, light, is light a wave or a particle? And there was a controversy in, in, in uh, the 17th century between Newton and Huygens about that. Uh, what is the velocity of light? Does it propagate in vacuum or in a medium? These are questions which were, which, uh, were uh, uh, asked and uh, answered by people like Newton, Huygens, Jung, Friedel, Fizeau from the 17th to the 19th century. At the same time, there was also a very deep question about matter. What is, how does matter carry electricity? From where the, do the magnetic properties of matter come? What is the structure of matter? And of course, how does it interact with light? And then you have people like Coulomb, Faraday, Ersted, Ampere, and finally Maxwell, which, who capped everything. And from this uh, interrogation uh, have come great discoveries and I summarize on the right part of the slide in a few lines what we have learned. Light is an electromagnetic wave which propagates through space at a velocity, uh, very high velocity, 300,000 kilometers per second, and this velocity is independent of the observer. Uh, wherever you move or are at a constant uh, restless, if it means something, you see the light with the same velocity. Uh, and uh, it's also, uh, an ensemble of particles, which have been called photons, which carry energy and momentum. About matter, we can say that matter, as you all, we all know now, is made of atoms which combine positively charged uh, uh, nuclei and negative electrons, which can occupy only quantized uh, orbit, only uh, discrete energy states. They carry small magnetic moments. And when they go from one state to another, they absorb or emit a photon with energy correspond to the energy difference between the states. So this is what we learned from that. And uh, more, even more importantly, uh, light and matter obey strange laws, which have been alluded in, in the introductory speech. Uh, things like state superposition, the fact that a quantum system can be at a different place at once. Another strange uh, fact is entanglement, the fact that two systems which have interacted remain in a correlated state which cannot be explained classically. So these ideas are very important in modern quantum physics, and all this has culminated in two theories which have revolutionized at the beginning of the 20th century uh, knowledge about the world, quantum physics and relativity. And people, Einstein has played a fundamental role in both uh, quantum physics and relativity, and people like uh, Niels Bohr, Heisenberg, uh, Planck, and others have uh, been very important. So we all know that. But uh, what I wanted to stress here is that all this has started from curiosity-driven interrogations about the nature of light and the nature of matter. So let's go a little. Uh, what I want to say now is that uh, the scientists who made these discoveries had no idea about what they would be applied to. Uh, when even in the 1920s, Einstein, Bohr, and Heisenberg never said, we are the fathers of the first re quantum revolution. They did not know it was a revolution in applied science. But in fact, they have led to innovation which have changed our lives, our ways to produce energy, think about nuclear reactors, to communicate, to store and process information, to probe matter, to perform medical diagnosis, and so on. And this, all this has come from this kind of uh, uh, ideas, discoveries. 
these applications have emerged often in a very unexpected way from the combination of different breakthroughs in fundamental physics. And they have come after a long maturation time. Decades have passed between the fundamental discovery and the application. And uh, in, in the remainder, remainder of this talk, I will look at a few examples. But I would like to start in the pre-quantum era with uh, the discovery, the unification of electricity, magnetism, and optics by Maxwell, because I think it was a really maybe the greatest piece of useless research. In fact, what, Einstein, what Maxwell did was to combine results which had been obtained by Ampère and Faraday at the beginning of the 19th century, and he showed that electric and magnetic fields, whose concept was invented by Faraday in the 1840s, were related to each other, that the variation of an electric field produced a magnetic field, which in turn, whose variation in turn produced an electric field, and all this was propagating through space. And he was able to write the equation which describes the propagation of these combined fields. And this is a page of the manuscript in which he describes this for the first time. This manuscript is at the Royal Society in London. And uh, the, the, really the breaking point was the fact that he was able with this equation to compute the speed of the electromagnetic wave through space. This speed was a combination of uh, constants which were known by, which had been uh, introduced in physics by Coulomb and Ampère, the electrostatic constant which describe how, which uh, account for the strengths of the electric force between two particles, and the magnetostatic uh, static constant by Ampère which describes the strengths of the magnetic forces between currents. And when he put this two constant in this formula, he found a velocity of 308,000 kilometers per second, and he immediately realized that this velocity was very close to the one that Foucault and Fizeau uh, about 10 years earlier had measured for the propagation of light. And so he uh, described this on this page, you see here, maybe you cannot see it clearly, but this is the velocity that he found uh, uh, Foucault's velocity and here his velocity. And I want to stress one interesting point. Maxwell is expressing the velocities in, ki in meter per second and not in uh, feet uh, per second or miles per, per second. So he used the uh, international system of units. And I'm afraid to say that England has not yet really decided to use this system because it still talks about miles and pounds and so on. And uh, and also, so immediately realized that, and the last three lines here are the lines, uh, maybe I think one of the most important lines in, in, in science, and uh, since it's difficult to read them here, I have reproduced this text here. The agreement of the results seems to show that light and magnetism are affections of the same substance, and that light is an electromagnetic perturbation propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. So, with this flourish language of 19th century, he expressed the unification of electricity, magnetism, and optics in, in one sentence. And of course, this has led uh, to great revolutions in science. Light is an electromagnetic disturbance, and of course, it means that light is only a very small part of a very large spectrum. Uh, light is correspond to wavelengths comprised between 0.4 and 0.8 micron. But at longer wavelengths, you have infrared radio waves, which are not known at the time. At shorter wavelengths, you have UV, ultraviolet, and then X-rays, which were not known. And during the decade which has followed Maxwell, this new radiation, invisible light, have been discovered. Uh, Hertz, uh, already said, discovered radio waves in 1885, and Hertz was looking for them. He wanted to show that indeed you had this kind of wave. So it was a, a conscious search for that. On the other side, uh, the X-rays was discovered by chance, by Röntgen. He just show, uh, discovered that by sending cathode rays, which were later on uh, uh, found to be electrons, were producing, when they impinged on, on the metallic cathode, were producing mysterious rays that he called X-rays, which were 
a few years later uh, found out to be short wavelength radiation. But these two uh, discoveries led to a revolution in technology, and I don't have to insist about the radio broadcasting, microwave application, X-ray medical diagnosis, and so on. So it led to a huge amount of uh, in devices and inventions, and even more importantly, these are interrogations about uh, this uh, radiation which led to relativity, quantum physics, and, and cosmology, and so on. It's the fact that it was impossible to understand the, how light interacts with matter using classical physics, which led to quantum mechanics, and the fact that uh, it was in, impossible to understand why velocity of light was independent of the observer, which led to relativity. So, and, and again, these new theories, which came from uh, these uh, discoveries about light, led to other applications. This was at the turn of the century, between the, 19, uh, the, uh, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. At that time, people were thinking that we were at the end of physics. Even someone at Lord Kelvin had made a famous statement that we knew almost everything and there was nothing left to be discovered. This was a scientist, but a layman, people, the general public, was, of course, very much impressed by the discoveries of X-rays and radio waves, and there was a big hope that we, we were in a time where a lot of new technologies and powerful devices were invented. This was a time of uh, uh, big world fairs. In 1900, there was a big world fair in Paris, during which a lot of monuments were still there in Paris, like the Grand Palais were, were built, and it was just after the building of the Eiffel Tower, and uh, the, the, the trust in progress was very big, and there was a lot of enthusiasm, and people were asked at that time to try to imagine what the world would be in the year 2000. And this is a kind of postcard of job published. Uh, this would be, uh, this was an extrapolation uh, over the telephone, you see that, this is even more funny. It's an extrapolation uh, saying that we'll be hitting ourselves with just pieces of radium in, in the fireplace. So it was, you can, you can think that it's a prediction of nuclear power plants, but it's a very strange way to, to use uh, nuclear power. And he, this is how they saw the email. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, it was, it was funny because it was just, they could not even, think about well, what, what are the quantum technology uh, of the 20th century. They could not, of course, dream about the computers. They could not dream about the laser, about uh, the atomic clocks and the GPS, about uh, MRI scanners. And all these technologies come from quantum physics. And how did this come about will be the topic of the remainder of this talk. I think. We can start with a very simple and very uh, important experiment which was performed in 1922 by a German physicist Otto Stern working in Hanover, uh, which uh, discovered the magnetic moment of the electron. In fact, Otto Stern was trying to answer a typically blue sky question, what is what is the size of the magnetism of atoms? We knew, uh, since Ampere, it was known that atoms were carrying magnetism. Ampere had made the hypothesis that the magnetic moments of atoms are coming from some microscopic currents, circular currents inside the atom. The, the size of these currents was not known. So Stern devised a very simple experiment. You, he put silver atoms in a furnace, heated the furnace, and the atoms were just extracted in the vacuum and formed atomic beams propagating in free space, and these atomic, these beams of atoms were propagating in the gap between two, the two uh, poles of an electro, strong electromagnet, which produced a, an elect, a varying magnetic field, a gradient of magnetic field. The idea was that the force exerted by this field on the magnet would deflect uh, the uh, atoms, and what he expected to see is a continuous trace, because the force was depending upon the angle between the magnetic gradient and the direction of the magnetic moment. 
And since, since this angle was classically supposed to vary continuously, he expected to see a straight line. In fact, the atoms were detected on a glass, just a simple glass plate here, and he saw a trace. And uh, the story says that at the beginning, he did not see anything because the silver atom did not leave a visible trace on the glass. But it happened that at that time, uh, they were just smoking in the lab, and uh, the smoke deposited on the glass made a chemical reaction with the silver atom that there was a dark trace coming from that. So you see that uh, this could not happen today if you cannot sm smoke in, in the lab. <laughs> so, and what they saw instead of a continuous trace is two spots, discrete spots, so they discovered the quantization of the magnetic moments. And from the deflection, of course, they could measure the magnetic moment, and it turned out that what was seen here the magnetic moment on silver is carried by the electron of the silver atom, so he measured the magnetic moment of the electron called the spin, electron spin. And uh, he found out, of course, that the spin can only be oriented up or down, and the setup separates the magnetic moments pointing up and down, and he showed up uh, uh, special quantization. You see here the trace that he, in fact, observed. You see here separation, but of course, on the edge, since the magnetic gradient decreases, the two uh, spots converge and you have a kind of leaps. And this signal, which is a very simple, not technological at all, a, a signal which involves a very, very small amount of sophisticated technology, heralds the quantum revolution in technology. We see that all derives from that. The next step was taken a few years later by a postdoc of uh, Otto Stern, Isidore Rabi was an American physicist who went into Otto Stern's lab to uh, get acquainted about this technology. And uh, this is a time when uh, the postdoc were going eastward from America to Europe and before they started going in the opposite direction a few years later for reasons that are well known. In fact, Otto Stern had also to flee uh, Germany during the Nazi time. But Rabi uh, brought this uh, molecular beam machine at Columbia University and he uh, improved it, he improved the design because he wanted to be much more sensitive. He wanted to measure the magnetic moment of nuclei and the nuclei have a much smaller magnetic moment because they have a larger mass, and so they precess at a slower pace, and the magnetic moment is about a few thousand times smaller. And so for that, he designed a setup in which the gradient is divided into two zones. In zone A, the gradient points in one direction, in zone B, in the opposite direction, which means that the, the atoms carrying a magnetic moment will undergo an S-shaped trajectory and if everything is all right, they will converge here on a detector, which is just a hot wire. When the atoms collide this hot wire, electrons are ejected, and so you have an electric current. And the magnitude of this current is proportional to the flux of atom reaching the wire. And then he added a third ingredient here, zone C. This is really the improvement, the breakthrough. In zone C, he added a cavity in which you can apply radio, radio waves, the one which has been discovered by Hertz, and if you choose the frequency of this radio wave so that it corresponds to the energy difference between the spin up and spin down, it will flip the spin, and if it flips the spin, the spin will miss the, the, the detector. The spin, instead of converging the detector, will miss it, which means that if you tune at the right frequency, you will get a dip in the signal. And this resonance dip in the signal is called nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. It is the first NMR signal. And using this technique, Rabi and his students detected a lot of magnetic moment. And I want to show you now that this discovery of magnetic resonance opens the way to MRI, atomic clocks, GPS, and lasers. But of course, a lot of steps had to be taken be before this happened. The question is, did Rabi understand that this discovery was a breakthrough which would lead to applications. There is a hint that he did, and this hint is shown on uh, this slide. This is the 
front page of the New York Post in December 1939. Apparently, a journalist attended to a scientific meeting which was held uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and the headline said, we are all radio stations, Columbia scientists report. All atoms in humans or in steel <coughs> are found to emit and receive long waves. So what I think what uh, Rabbi said that the atoms which are in my machine are the same as the one we have in our bodies. And so if you apply radio frequency field to them, they will radiate, they will scatter radio waves. And these radio waves carry information like broadcasting stations. And I don't know how far he went into this analogy, but this is of course a description of MRI of all kinds of nuclear magnetic resonance. But indeed, if you want to apply that, other steps have to be taken. It's impossible. You cannot detect the atoms inside your body with a hot wire. Or with, you cannot, this is invasive. You have to be able to detect it from outside. And for that, you have to be able to detect the waves that these atoms are emitting. And this step was taken just after the Second World War by these two physicists, Felix Bloch and Ed Purcell, who invented NMR in solids and liquids. How can you do that? Of course, when you are in a solid or a liquid, the density of matter is much bigger, but you cannot detect the atoms by counting them. What you can detect is the light, the radio frequencies that the atoms are scattering. And this is a kind of device that they developed. In this sample here, you have a liquid, but you could have a solid too, which contains the atoms that you want to measure. Here you have a ge frequency generator which uh, generate radio waves and these radio waves are sent in a coil which emit radio waves inside the sample. You have a magnetic field uh, produced by this uh, magnet here. And here you have a second coil, a receiver coil. So this is one coil is uh, the emitter, the other coil is a receiver. And when the frequency is right and we scan the frequency, you see resonances. These resonances tell you which kind of element you have inside. The, the width of the resonance also tells you what is the environment, because if you have electric and magnetic field which perturb uh, the atoms in the surrounding, it will, be, it will be shown in this way. So you get a lot of information about, about the structure and uh, the properties of the system. What I want to stress is that this is a blue sky discovery, but it, is made, it has been made possible by technology. It is because radio, uh, uh, radio emitters had been developed during the Second World War for the radar that uh, uh, this has been possible. In fact, Ed Purcell was working at MIT to uh, uh, invent the radar, and so he used that. So you see that the connection between basic science and uh, applied science goes both ways. And of course, immediately, this has been applied to probe in physics, in chemistry, and biology uh, different materials. And it has led a few years later, as we will see, to MRI. But I want to stop for a second and to show you here the first, uh, the introduction of Ed Purcell Nobel Lecture. Ed Purcell got the Nobel Prize in 1952, and he wrote the uh, first sentence was, Professor Bloch has told you, so I assume that Bloch gave his lecture just before Purcell. Professor Bloch has told you how one can detect the precession of the magnetic nuclei in a drop of water. And then he went on saying, I remember in the winter of our first experiments, just seven years ago, that in 1945, looking on snow with new eyes. These, the snow, there the snow lay around my doorstep great heaps of protons quietly processing in the Earth's magnetic field. To see the world for a moment as something rich and strange is a private reward of many a discovery. So I think this expressed very well the kind of excitement, exaggeration that you uh, 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 feel when you observe for the first time something that nobody has observed before you and when you understand it. So this is blue sky research. And then immediately comes what can we learn from all this about the structure of matter? So what could be the applications? So, and, and here, uh, just a, a slide about 
MRI because I think it's a very uh, important breakthrough. We, we, in our bodies, we have a lot of water molecules, one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen carries a spin, a small magnetic moment, which presses in a magnetic field. If you put the body of the patient inside a big magnet, you need a high magnetic field to have a high frequency. And if, if this magnet is inhomogeneous, that is the size of the magnetic field depends on position inside, you will have a signal which will depend on position, and so you will be able to make a map of the density of protons as a function of position. Uh, for that, of course, you have to make uh, your, the spin inside your body flip between the two uh, states, two spin states, whose distance, whose uh, energy gap depends on the magnetic field. And uh, the scattering of radio waves of variable frequency in especially in homogeneous magnetic field makes possible a 3D map of the inside of the body. What I want to stress is that this is a conjunction of three quantum technologies. The superconducting magnet is based on the fact that you can have huge magnetic field produced without heat losses in a superconducting wire, and this is a quantum superconductivity, is a phenomenon which is explained in quantum physics. Of course, the spin precession NMR is quantum, and the computers which are necessary to decipher the signals and make images are based on the properties of transistors, which are also quantum. So it explains that, in fact, Purcell could not do that. There were no computers, and uh, he could not even think that this would happen one day. But this has happened, and there is a lot of application of this. Uh, one of the, that I think are the most promising is the use of NMR to learn about the brain. Uh, the, when, when the brain has an activity, for example, you move your arm or you think about something, it increases the flow of blood in this part of the brain. The blood is carrying hemoglobin molecules which have small magnets, it modifies the magnetic field, and you have a change in the NMR signal. It is called functional MRI, and this functional MRI is used to make very interesting studies of the brain, exploration of the brain function, even studying the emergence of consciousness is made possible by that. So this is one application. Now I want to say a few words about the atomic clock. And the, the modern atomic clock operates on an improved Rabi beam machine. In fact, here the blue sky breakthrough was made by Norman Ramsey, who was an, a student of, of Rabi, who uh, modified a little bit uh, the atomic beam you recognize here the oven. This is a stern garlic magnet which separates the spin up and the spin down. So one of the spin state is going through, uh, the cav through this cavity. And then you have an uh, analyzing magnet which allows you to decide whether, to find out whether the spin has flipped or not. And uh, the novelty here is that instead of having only one radio frequency zone, the atoms are crossing separately two zones in which pulses of magnetic uh, resonance field are applied. If you do that, there is a quantum interference effect which, say, which shows that instead of having a single resonance, you have fringes. You have a signal which is made of up and down uh, spin positions. And this is what I show here. You see that the resonance now takes this shape and the central fringe is very narrow and if you can point your system to the frequencies that you are on the top of this narrow fringe, you can point, uh, you can really pinpoint what is the frequency that the atom's transition is making. Now I want just to remind you that all clocks are based on the counting of periodic phenomena. The first clocks starting from the 17th century were mechanical man-made clocks, for example, Huygens clock, which allowed to make fantastic discoveries in particular, the first measurement of the velocity of light was a pendulum clock which beat at about one second. Then you got uh, the next improvement was the chronometer clock which was beating at hundreds uh, per second, small springs, and it was very important for navigation. Then you had the quartz clock which was beating at a few tens of kilohertz per second, which made in the middle of 20th century 
uh, clocks which are as precise as about one second, uh, deviation of about one second per year. I remember when I got my first quartz clock when I was a teenager, I was amazed that I could keep a clock which, was, which gave the right time uh, day after day and deviate only by a few seconds after, after, after one month. Now here, the, the clock is based on oscillation of electrons at nine gigahertz, which is five orders of magnitude higher than the quartz clock. And the, the, the back of the envelope rule is that the precision of the clock is proportional to the frequency of the clock. So you win all these orders of magnitude. And when you lock the microwave to lock the microwave to be at the center of this line, you have now a clock which has an accuracy of one second over a million years. And not only the, accuracy, the, the, the deviation becomes very small, but also all the cesium clocks have the same frequency. A man-made clock depends upon the length of the pendulum, the size of the crystal quartz. Here, it's a universal result because according to quantum physics, uh, the structure of atoms, of cesium atoms, is the same everywhere in the universe. So these clocks have made a huge progress on the precision of the measurement of time. And this is what is used, of course, for the GPS. These clocks are embarked on satellites. They send signals uh, to your receivers. This is what made this transparency. This slide was made a few years ago. Now you have it on your cell phone. And by getting the signals from a few uh, uh, satellites, you can, by triangulation, find your position on Earth with a precision of about one meter. Uh, in order for this to work, you have to correct for the fact that the clocks which are moving with respect to you uh, beat at a different rate because of special relativity. You have also to take into account that according to their altitude, they also beat at a different rate due to general relativity, the curvature of space-time. And if you did not make this correction, the GPS would not work. In fact, there is a legend, I don't know if it's true or not, which says that the first in, the engineers which developed the GPS system at the beginning were not very confident in Einstein's uh, uh, spooky theories. And they said, OK, we are engineers down to Earth. We, we will just make the clock as, as we think it should work. And uh, just to make sure, they had two softwares, one which were taking uh, relativity into account and the other not, and they very quickly realized that they could throw away uh, the software which was not correcting for the GPS, for the, the uh, relativity effect. So this is another fundamental application. The third one is the laser that we'll be talking about, and the laser is again a uh, blue sky, start from a blue sky discovery. So it's a this discovery of stimulated emission by Einstein. And Einstein wanted to solve a very fundamental question. In 1916, he wanted to recover Planck's law, the fact that Planck had uh, shown that the frequency, the distribution in frequency of the heat uh, radiation of heated bodies had a very special shape. And uh, Einstein, once Bohr had made the first model of the atom, Einstein tried to recover this by making the energy balance between the absorption and emission radiation by the atoms which are paving, which are paving the walls of, of uh, the cavity in which the radiation was being uh, uh, confined. So uh, what he knew is that if you have a two-level atom, uh, the atom can absorb radiation by absorbing photons. And according to Bohr, he can also the atom can also go back to the ground state by emitting spontaneously by stop this emission a photon. And by using these two processes, Einstein was unable to uh, retrieve Planck's law. In order to retrieve Planck's law, it had to add a third process, which is stimulated emission. Spontaneous emission, the photon is emitted randomly. In stimulated emission, what happens is that if one photon impinges on an excited atom, the atom will have a tendency to emit another photon exactly in the same mode, with the same frequency, the same phase, and the same direction. And if he added, by adding this third process, he retrieved Planck's law. So he in, discovered by just a theoretical argument based on pure uh, curiosity-driven research, this process of stimulated emission, which is the basis of the laser. How a laser works, you have to excite 
the atoms into the upper state by either by electric discharge or by side flash excitation. The excited atoms, uh, there is some noise due to spontaneous emission. And immediately, this noise is amplified by this process. And the light is going back and forth between two mirrors. If one mirror is slightly transparent, there is a beam of laser light which gets out. It took 40 years between Einstein and this. And in the way uh, uh, between these 40 years, you had the first application of stimulated emission, which uh, was made, I, I will tell you this in a moment, but I just want on this slide to summarize quickly the difference. The classical light is a kind of random light. This, this, the photons are emitted independently by the atoms with different phases, different direction, different frequencies. In laser light, the photons are all in step. They all propagate in the same direction. They all reinforce because they have the same phase, the amplitude of the field. So this is what I would call tame light by opposition to the wide light of classical sources. The first demonstration of this came not in the optical domain, but in the microwave domain. And again, you recognize him here, Rabi machine. This, is, this was in, at, again at Columbia University, Charlie Towns, and his student Gordon in front of the first device of this kind. It was called a MASER as an acronym for microwave amplifier by stereo emission radiation, and he produced the first MASER. It was a variant of the Rabi beam machine, and of course the question was what was the use for, for this? There are many uses of the MASERs, but of course the lasers have many more uses. The laser is just an extension of this in the optical domain. It was invented by Mayman a few years later, and you just change the M of microwave by the L of light, and you get the laser. And uh, it's a fantastic source of light. On this transparent, on this slide, I summarize uh, what are the main properties. First of all, you can concentrate a lot of energy on a very small spot, so you can achieve fusion and evaporation of matter uh, if you can reach the highest temperature existing at, at, inside stars. In fact, there is a project to achieve fusion with uh, laser light. Uh, but uh, on the opposite side, you can use also laser light to cool matter. You can, use, you can make uh, atoms absorb and re-emit photons in such a way that they lose energy and momentum. And in this way, you reach the coldest temperature achieved in the US. You can, uh, get to less than one billionth of, a, of a K, the absolute degree. Uh, if you look at a logarithmic scale of temperatures, room temperature is closer to the temperature of the inside of the stars than to the temperature of the lowest temperature of, of, uh, um, that you can reach. At these extremely low temperatures, you have new phases of matter, in particular what is called the Bose-Einstein condensation. This is again a blue sky discovery by Einstein in fact, the last great discovery of Einstein in 1923, he said if you are able to cool some atoms called bosons to a temperature which is low enough, they will condensate in the same state, and create a state which has new properties, non-classical properties, superfluidity, uh, and this matter has been discovered in 1995. This is 70 years after Einstein's prediction, and they are now used in many, many devices which may have application, metrological application in particular. So this is again one possibility. And another possibility, uh, another interesting properties of these lasers is that can, they can be ultra stable. You can build lasers whose oscillation does not skip a single bit over millions of kilometers. And this is a kind of light which is used in a new kind of optical clocks which I will talk about just in a few minutes in the conclusion of this talk, which allow you to build clocks which are incredibly even much more precise than the microwave clocks that I described to you before. And so just to conclude this slide, it's a, it's a fantastic tool for fundamental research in physics, in chemistry, in biology, and for applications to metrology, medicine, communication, and so on. And this all came from the laser. In fact, I was lucky, uh, the big, great luck in my life as a scientist is that I 
I started doing my PhD in the 1960s when the laser was invented. And I must tell you it was fascinating to see the laser beams in the lab, but we, we had some dreams about what we could do with them, but we never imagined as that they would be going so far in all kinds of directions. So this has been really fantastic uh, half a century, I would say. So I would just conclude by making a review of a few recent applications of the laser in basic science, and which may have very important uh, impact, impact on technology. Uh, this, is, this picture is taken from the lab of uh, David Wineland that you mentioned. David Wineland was a kind of wizard for uh, the, the trapping and manipulating of single ions. So if you remove an electron from an atom, you get a charged atom, and you can manipulate this charged atom by the electric charge and build traps in which the, these atoms are held at fixed positions. Here you see five beryllium atoms in a trap. You see that these are the electrons of the trap. The, the atoms are these five points. Why do they stay like that? They want to go at the center of the trap, but they repel each other because they are charged. So they take an equilibrium position. Of course, each atom is much smaller than what you see. What you see here is the light that the atoms scatter when they are excited by laser. The atom it goes from one state, absorb a photon, then re-emit it, reabsorb and re it. So a single atom is scattering a photon a million times. So it amplifies, you see a lot of photons with a single atom, but of course you see a big spot because of uh, the laws of diffraction. So each, each of these spots is an atom, uh, even if the spot is about 1,000 times larger than the actual atom. Now, what is very interesting is that the atom scatters light in one state, but if you put it in another state, it will be dark, it will not scatter. So you can find out whether, the, if you make an analogy with a spin, you can decide whether the spin is down or up, because in one case it scatters light, in the other case it doesn't. And so this can be used not only to look at the atom, but also to find out whether it is in one state or the other, and this is the basis of the atom manipulation. This, this was in 2000. Here you see 14 atoms in the lab of Rainer Blatt in Innsbruck. Here are 30 atoms. And in fact, now uh, Rainer Blatt is able to go to up to something between 50 and 100 atoms. And each atom can be addressed independently from the other. And each atom is a two-level system. So you get an ensemble of spin. You can address them individually. They are coupled to each other because, uh, in fact, they oscillate. They have come a, a, a collective mode of oscillation. And with the laser, you can excite the internal state and at the same time excite one photon, one quantum of vibration. And using this, you can have atoms talk to each other. If you use two lasers which interrogate one atom and the other, you can make what is called a quantum gate, a system which couples two of these systems. Now, the big difference with classical physics is that each atom is a two-level bit which can evolve in a superposition of zero and one state. The atoms can be entangled, so I don't have time to talk about this. Uh, a lot of you around the, uh, in this room know about that. But this is the basis of a quantum logic operation. You can entangle the atom. You can, uh, you can have them talk to each other at a distance. You can detect that. So this is uh, what I will call uh, let me, a, a kind of atomic abacus for quantum information. Uh, if you have 30 atoms like you show, you see here, uh, you see that in fact, you have two to the 30 states, about one billion states are hidden here, and not only one billion states, but all the quantum superpositions of this billion states, and this, is, this give all the wealth and pos at least theoretical possibilities of quantum information. In my lab in Paris, we, do the we did the opposite. Instead of trapping atoms and looking, uh, using photons to manipulate them, we do the opposite. Trap the photons between two mirrors, and we send atoms, in fact, special atoms called Rydberg atoms, excited atoms, which are strongly coupled to the radio uh, wave in the cavity. So one atom interacts with the cavity in which you have one or a few photons. I don't know why it does not work anymore. Let me. Yeah, you send atom one by one, 
across the cavity, and you can interrogate the field by looking at the atoms when they leave, left the cavity. In fact, there was a small movie, but apparently on, on this computer, the movie does not run, but uh, I can tell you the atoms cross the cavity one by one, and then you detect them. And you can do a lot of things. You can count the photons without destroying them because the atoms are just get, taking a kind of phase imprint on them without absorbing the photons. And you can also prepare the, the photons in the cavity in strange states. This, what you see here, is a kind of two-dimension map which show you the phase and the amplitude of the field. These two peaks correspond to fields which have opposite phases. So these two fields coexist at the same time in the cavity. And the fact that it's a quantum superposition is revealed by the fact that you have interferences, fringes between the two. So in fact, you prepare what is called the Schrodinger cat. It's analogous to the famous cat that Schrodinger imagined to be at the same time dead and alive after having interacted with a single atom here. You have a cavity field which is at the same time in two states after having interacted with a single atom. And these states are now being used in quantum information uh, to code and decode information and to uh, process what is called error correcting codes to uh, uh, try to suppress or to correct for all decoherence effects. I don't have time to discuss that, but I just wanted to show you uh, this. And, and this demonstrates atom field entanglement and showing a cat field. Let's go to the next slide. So what, 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 would, what can we expect from what some people call the second quantum revolution? Why do the, we call that the second quantum revolution, or some people call that that way? The first quantum revolution is the one I talked to you before in the 20th century. It was exploiting quantum properties, but bulk quantum properties. The quantum properties which, which explain superconductivity, which explain uh, semiconductor physics, which explain the laser. Here the quantum is, so to speak, veiled. You never see directly quantum jumps or quantum superposition. Just understand what's going on inside matter made of a huge number of atoms. Here what we want to do is to exploit the uh, superposition principle or entanglement at in the, what I call the naked quantum, really the quantum which appears directly to your eyes which looks like what, happened, what the founding fathers of quantum physics described as thought experiments. And this is what we hope to achieve. Quantum metrology, which, which would use the fragile features of quantum states to measure very small effects which mo with more sensitivity than by classical means. And uh, uh, this is the last example I will take. I will say a few words about the optical clocks, which are now fantastically precise. The second application, which I would just mention, is quantum communication. You can, sh you can share qubits between two partners, and then when, when you do measurement, you can transfer information from one point to the other without uh, being possibility of spying, using quantum properties to protect the secrecy of communication. And this can be done between uh, uh, points in, in on, on the Earth through a satellite link, and there are experiments which are performed between China and Europe which demonstrate this possibility. Then, quantum simulation. This is a very interesting field. If you are able to prepare to arrange atoms in a one, two, or three dimensional crystal, you make an artificial medium in which the atoms are separated by micrometer instead of angstroms, and you can read in which quantum state the atoms are using the technique I described before. And by changing the parameters continuously, you can look at phase transitions. You can look at how the system evolves from one set to the other. For example, you can have either all the spins aligned, this is a ferromagnetic material, or uh, cases in which the spins are anti-aligned uh, periodically, this is anti-ferromagnetic material. And you can see this, for example, here, it's, it, this is a real experiment. This is a ferromagnetic uh, structure, and this is an antiferromagnetic one. You see only one out of two atoms. The other one is here, but invisible. And you can look at the condition which allow you to go from one state to the other, and you can study even more complicated phases. So the hope is that you could use this one day to, to find the way to synthesize new materials which may have interesting properties. And the last example, which is, of course, the one that everybody is dreaming about, would be I don't know what's going on here. 
the quantum computing, the idea is to exploit state superposition and entanglement to solve problems that classical computers cannot tackle. And uh, one candidate is artificial atom superconducting circuits, which have discrete quantum state that you can couple to each other by classical circuits. Here you have a very small picture which shows a kind of prototype here, but a lot of research remains to be done to make it really useful. But let me conclude with optical atomic clocks. Now the clock is based on the transition, optical transition, which is five orders of magnitude higher in frequencies than the cesium clock. And you get this, so you have here the laser, which uh, crosses this crystal. This crystal, of course, is an crystal, artificial crystal, which requires a lot of lasers to keep the atoms here. So you have a lot of lasers acting on the collection of atoms. The atoms are very cold. And these five orders of magnitude is gained on the precision of the clock. So now instead of one second in one million year, you get one twentieth of a second in 14 billion years. That is, two clocks which have been synchronized at the beginning of the universe would not deviate from each other than more than a twentieth of a second now. So it's a fantastic precision. At this level, the general relativity effect, which says that the, the curvature of space-time, which requires a correction between the satellite and the Earth, can be seen now at a level of one millimeter. If you displace the clock by one millimeter in the gravitational field of the Earth, you see this effect. So this is, this is a, a fantastic, fantastic experiment, uh, which have been performed last year by my group at, in Boulder, the group of Jenny. So, this means that inside the clock, the time is not the same at the top and at the bottom of the clock. So this is a kind of illustration of Salvador Dali's uh, soft watches. The, the, the time, you have now a situation where the definition of the time becomes fuzzy because of this, this kind of precision. So it means that if you move a clock around the Earth, you will be able to study the exact shape of the Earth because the gravitational field will depend on this shape. So the idea is that you can use ultra precision optical clock to determine the exact shape of the geoid, which is not an exact sphere. And you may also hope that if you have small changes inside, which are the precursor of earthquakes, you will be able to predict them. So this leads me to the conclusion. And I want to make a conclusion which, is, uh, which brings us back in history. What I want to say is that this connection to basic science and applied science this search, curiosity-driven search for, for example, the size of the Earth is something which started a long time ago. I come back to the 18th century. Then one question was, what is the exact shape of the Earth? And there were different conflicting theories. Cassini, which was the French, uh, 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 the director of the Paris Observatory, had measured the meridian, the one degree of the distance between two, two degrees of latitude in the south and the north of France. If the, the Earth was a sphere, it should be the same. But if the Earth was, let's say, prolate like a lemon, it should become smaller north than it is south. And this is what Cassini said. He said, the Earth is prolate. Now, other observation had been made at the end of the 17th century. Uh, there is a French astronomer who went to Cayenne in Guyana, where he uh, wanted to make uh, observation of the uh, position of Mars. The idea was to make a, a parallax measurement to find the velocity of light, and it, it's always the first velocity of light measurement. But for that, he needed a clock, and he brought a clock with him, Hoyhen's clock, which has a precision of a few seconds per day. And he found that the clock was beating slower at the equator, and the idea was that, in fact, the Earth is oblate, and at the equator, the clock was farther from the center of the Earth. So there was two conflicting theories, and of course, you needed an experiment for that. Immediately, uh, Newton and Hoyhen said the Earth should be oblate, because as it is revolving, the centrifugal force should push the equator further from the center. So. Was to this, and, but Cassini had a lot of influence, especially on the king, because he was a friend of the king. So the French Academy decided to send two expeditions, one at the polar circle, the other at the equator, 
in South America to answer this question unambiguously by measuring one degree of latitude, the distance between one degree of latitude north and south. And they said, if you do that, you, you can make an error if you do that with uh, points which are close to each other. But if you re repeat the measurement of a large number of degrees, the relative error will decrease. So they knew about the square root of n decrease in the error zone, increase the number of measurements. So they sent the two expeditions. And what I want to say is that it was, a, it was a, a very expensive and a very dangerous blue sky research. They sent Maupertuis. Maupertuis was a French mathematician, very famous one. He was one who discovered the principle of least action, the fact which is, a, which is an equivalent way of stating Newton's law. And the principle of least action is a fundamental principle in modern physics. But at the same time, he was ready to be an adventurer. He went to the North Pole with Swedish uh, colleagues, and they measured the degree of longitude there. And another expedition led by Lacan d'Amin, who was another academician, went to uh, the Andes Mountains between Quito and Cuenca, south of Quito. And this is a map. And you see here these triangles, which were used by triangulation to measure one degree of longitude. It took him 10 years. Some of his colleagues died uh, for various reasons. And it took him one or two years to come back to France after that. And when they compared the result, the conclusion was unambiguously that the Earth was indeed oblate. The Earth is oblate like an orange. And so uh, Voltaire uh, wrote to Maupertuis, saying, congratulating Maupertuis for having, uh, sque for having uh, squeezed the Earth and the Cassini, <laughs> because he was an enemy. He was an enemy of Cassini. In fact, uh, I can give you an, an, another story about Cassini. Cassini was, as I said, very influential at the court, and the uh, ladies in attendance of the queen were friends of Cassini. And one day in 1759, I think there was an eclipse in Paris, and Cassini invited all the court to attend to the eclipse at the Paris Observatory. And one of the ladies was preparing herself, was not ready, and so someone came to her, hurry up, hurry up, uh, uh, Monsieur Cassini is waiting for you. And she said, oh, Monsieur Cassini is one of my friends. He will redo the eclipse for me. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the end, Cassini lost this, uh, right? But I, I, this, uh, here I want to show you how Maupertuis explained the story at the French Academy. And I want to show you this because this uh, shows that even at that time, the, 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 the stress between basic and applied science was important. This is in French, very uh, 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 beautifully looking French, but this is a translation in English. The academy was a split on this issue of blackness or politeness of the earth. Its own lights on this question have left it unable to decide because they, they did not dare to say that Cassini was wrong. When the king expressed his will to resolve this big question, which was not one of the vain speculation whose idleness and or useless subtlety sometimes keeps the uh, first busy, this is basic science. <laughs> but a question which must have real influences on astronomy and navigation, and this is applied science. So he understood that you had to give explanation. And we today, when we write, a proposal for your research, even if it's basic science, we have to explain why it might be one day useful. And this, is, this comes back to, to the 18th century. So the, here I just want to summarize the, this kind of symbiotic connection between uh, basic and applied science. You start by observing nature. This uh, uh, leads to theoretical models. This model predicts new effects. These new effects lead to uh, new devices. I think this device is dying on me. Novel technologies. And these technologies are used to confirm or to uh, disprove uh, the observations. And uh, this is what I call uh, a virtuous loop. And of course, you have a lot of application in between. So what, what can we expect now? This is a quotation. People say that it's Bo who said that. Uh, I don't know if it's true. And uh, of course, to answer this question, we have to, uh, to be careful, think about 
uh, the postcard that I was discussing before. So what will the second quantum revolution be? Uh, quantum computers, quantum communication, network, uh, quantum meters, something is quite different. Probably there will be things quite different. But we can know one thing, without basic research, novel technologies cannot be. What happened? I think the computer thinks that it was too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the following one. Yeah, the Okay. And uh, uh, I hope I convinced you that this wonderful application comes very often in unexpected ways after a long maturation time. But I want just a final word. I want to say that very often you justify basic science by saying, oh, it, one day it will be useful. But I think even if it is not useful, it is essential. Even what you do, for example, in astronomy or in astrophysics, which should never be useful, is essential because it's part of building a knowledge uh, which is part of civilization. And this was a point that Flexner, to come back to him, uh, insisted upon in, in his talk. He, he said that beyond its usefulness, basic knowledge is an essential pursuit of mankind, especially necessary to preserve the values of civilization in dark or dangerous times. And I think we are now in a dark and dangerous time, so I want to quote uh, Flexner in the end. Is it not a curious fact that in a world uh, sh uh, steeped in irrational hatred which threatens civilization itself, men and women, old and young, detach themselves wholly or partly from the angry current of daily life to deviate themselves to the cultivation of beauty, to the extension of knowledge, to the cure of disease, to the amelioration of suffering, just as though fanatics were not simultaneously engaged in spreading pain, ugliness, and suffering. I think this is a, a very good summary of what we discussed yesterday. And I like the old and young. You have old and young people discussing these ideas. And uh, this is an introduction to the usefulness of useless knowledge. And I conclude here and apologize for the long talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Harosh, for the enlightenment, enlightening talk. Uh, now I would like to request Ms. Laura to mediate the Q&A session. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Serge, you. for this uh, enlightening illustration of the, the value of, mm. of uh, basic science. Um, and uh, this, this quote was chillingly uh, present uh, pr mm. considering the time we're living through right now. It's a it's beautiful quote. Thank you so much. Well, we have uh, time for a few questions, depending on the length no, of no, your it's answers. <laughs> but, it's uh, my fault if we are late, so I have to. to uh, but I, I think that <laughs> no one regrets <laughs> you having spent all that time. Yeah. It's been okay. fantastic. So please raise your hand if you have any question, and uh, tell us your name, please, and go ahead and please keep the question short. Sure. Thank you. It's known that it's psychologically healthy to have fun and play. Do you think that it, this is a time in history when maybe we need to start doing science because it's fun and for that reason alone, rather than for applications? Excuse me. Uh, Do you think you... that if scientists pursued science purely for the joy of it, rather than purely for the future application, that it would help spread the joy of discovery and help you know, relieve some of the stress that the world is under? Uh, I think it's quite clear that uh, when Einstein uh, looked for the general theory of relativity, it was blue sky research. He wanted to, to understand 
the inconsistencies in Newton, in Newton gravitation, or the fact that uh, according to Newton, gravitation was propagated instantaneously from the action at distance effect. And so he took seven or eight years to derive this, but he had no idea of what he would find, and the application to cosmology and the understanding to cosmology went after that. It was again blue sky research. What was applied is the fact that it's useful to, uh, uh, to, to build the GPS and it's useful to, to build and understand modern clocks. So there, there is here this connection. But, uh, and what is remarkable also, what I find absolutely fantastic is the fact that the same year as Einstein uh, found the theory of general relativity, or one year later, he found the principle of the laser. And in fact, the lasers are essential in gravitational uh, wave antennas to detect gravitational waves. So he invented, he invented, discovered the theory, and in, was at the, at the base of the invention of the, of the instrument which made, which uh, made the observation of, of uh, the theory possible. Just to follow your answer, though, um, was well, Einstein uh, doing that? Sorry. Okay. Well, a, a quick one. So since we're a bit short in time, it would be great to give other people. But go ahead. If I, I feel like you missed the intention of my question, though. It's more that like Einstein spent eight years doing that because he wanted to do it, not because you know the, the funding agency was going to give him money for eight years to do it. Like. No one would ever grant eight money for eight years no. to do that. Right? No, you know? no, he, he did not need any money because he got a good salary from the Prussian Academy of Sciences because he was already recognized as a great scientist. And by the way, when he, uh, an, another interesting anecdote, when, when Planck uh, invited him to join Berlin, uh, Planck had to write, of course, to, his, uh, to the members of the faculty in Berlin that Einstein was outstanding and that he should be appointed. But Planck added, of course, everybody makes mistakes and uh, we should not uh, uh, hail against Einstein the fact that he introduced this strange notion of the photon. And so <laughs> you, you see that even Planck didn't believe in the photon. And, uh, and in fact, uh, Einstein got a few years later, he got a Nobel Prize for the photon and not for relativity because relativity was controversial and it was controversial for bad reasons because uh, Lennart and Stark, who are two uh, German physicists, were against relativity because it, they said it was a Jewish science. And so the Swedish Academy of Sciences was influenced by, uh, by German uh, physicists and they did not agree with uh, Stark and Lennart, but they, they were very cautious. They wanted to give him the Nobel Prize, so they chose another topic uh, to give it to him. And I, what I want to say is that Einstein could have had, according to the standard of the Nobel Committee, he deserved half a dozen Nobel Prizes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, please. See? Si. Yeah. Maybe you can speak without the... You can take mine, if you like. <laughs> so, my name is Sun Kading, and we all know that mathematics is quite important for physics. I just wonder, what's your opinion about uh, the relationship between mathematics and physics, and how to view the relationship correctly when we do the researches, so sort of thing? Well, I think the, the relationship is essential. It's clear that uh, a lot of uh, uh, theoretical discoveries in physics are based on previous uh, uh, mathematical uh, theories. For example, group theory, which was uh, invented by Galois and Abel in the 19th century, uh, as a purely uh, mathematical uh, uh, theory was used in quantum physics to express the symmetries uh, of, of, of quantum physics. Uh, to come back to general relativity, Einstein had to learn tens tensor theory uh, to find out the equation of general relativity. And in fact, 
the, uh, the, the notebook in which he derived the equation of general relativity uh, start by a kind of self uh, course he took for himself to understand tensor theory. And you can multiply the examples. And now the people, the, mathem the physical, uh, I don't know if you call, should call them mathematicians or physicists, the people who work on string theory are looking for the laws of physics, but for the time being, they are just the, uh, obtaining mathematical results, which explains that uh, the guru of string theory got the field medal, but not the Nobel Prize, because uh, it's a mathematical theory which may one day turn into something useful for, for physicists. So but it's very mysterious to understand why uh, the human mind is able to conceive theories which later on prove to be important to describe the real world. And this is a question that maybe philosophers or epistemologists should uh, have to certainly tried to answer, but I don't know uh, at all. What's going. I cannot give you more explanation about that. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Doing, when you're doing your research and like on your way to achieve like the Nobel Prize, how do you navigate your way towards your discovery it's like without knowing your aim or without knowing like the results? Uh, this is a question about research. You ask yourself a question uh, to understand a phenomena which is not well understood. For example, what is magnetism? Why do you have ferromagnetism, anti-ferromagnetism? What leads from one to the other? And, and, and it uh, leads you to try to imagine experiments. Uh, in my case, uh, uh, my colleagues, what we, we uh, wanted, what we wanted to do is to realize in the lab the experiments that the founding fathers of quantum theory has imagined, what is called thought experiments. They said, okay, we take what would happen if we are able to, man to, to have two atoms, bring them closer, see how they interact, or you have one atom and one photon, how do they interact? In their case, they, they assumed that it would be always impossible to do because technology was so far away from that, but they imagined things. And at the same time, they said it would be impossible. Schrodinger wrote a very famous quotation saying, we often imagine that we deal with a single atom or a single electron or a single molecule. And he added, this is ridiculous. We will never be able to do it. Uh, and he assumed that we will always be able just to look at ensembles, big ensembles of macroscopic system, and that the quantum laws were hidden inside that, and we would never observe quantum jumps or uh, very naked quantum phenomena. So for us, the challenge was to prove them wrong, and we could do that because we had a new device like the laser, and this is brings to, back to technology, and we, we needed to wait for from the beginning of my uh, time as a researcher, I had to wait for 20 years before the lasers became technologically advanced enough to be able to do that. And so this, uh, of course, we, we, are, we did not design lasers. We are not engineers, but we use lasers when the lasers become commercially available. And what gave a little bit of advantage to the people working in the United States, for example, in California, is the fact that the laser companies were there. They could interact directly with the laser companies, and they could use prototypes of lasers before the, before the time the lasers became commercially available to the rest of the world. So, but, but this is just a, a small uh, remark. Essentially, we use commercially, and, and in the sense we do now, we, we use also mostly commercial lasers, commercial devices. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, up here. So it's more about a funding point of view. So how you get money from government uh, to invest on useless knowledge? Uh, can you repeat? How you get funding for useless, useless knowledge? Like. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> ah. I think I, what, what did he ask? I don't think so. How did you get funding for useless knowledge from government? Yeah. To get funding for yeah. useless oh, what We have to pretend that it will be useful one day. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I, I think, I think it's a, 
But I think this has some limits. If you oversell too much, uh, you, it will backfire one day. <laughs> and I think uh, in the case of quantum information, uh, pre uh, predicting or promising a quantum computer within 10 years is a little bit dangerous. And that's why I, I, I present this slide, slide showing what the people were imagining would be the technology of the 20th century. Uh, they were far off the target, uh, but uh, the fact that you did, that people did basic science was essential because this happened because basic science was there. So I think quantum, all what we do in quantum information is very useful, even if it does not lead to the kind of application. I can always already give you an example. 20 years ago, when we started all this, people were talking about quantum computers, but they did not talk about optical clocks. Optical clocks became possible with the invention of a device called the uh, uh, frequency comb laser, which allows you to divide an optical frequency and bring it back to a radio frequency, which make optical frequency uh, uh, possibility to count optical frequencies with, uh, with precision. This was not related to quantum information, but it became part of quantum information now. So it's always the case that you have a conjunction of uh, basic science done in different directions, which lead to unpredictable applications. Thank you. So one final question. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, uh, hello, uh, I'm James. Uh, I was actually one of the participants at Nobel Prize Dialogue yesterday, so I'd like to draw some parallels between the digital health discussion that you chaired yesterday and what we're discussing today. Yeah. So in the discussion yesterday, you mentioned that there's overwhelming information available right now, especially in the digital age, and like you alluded that the information that we receive every day is actually like more than what we have in a lifetime um, two, two centuries ago. So like how do we actually decide which information in this massive information flux is actually like useful or not so useful? Yeah, thank you. Again, I do not understand. I think it's my ear which is bad. So, so if I understand correctly, your question is in the deluge of information that we're facing, how to discern useful yes. information from noise? Uh, yep. Uh, this is a different issue. It has not, it, it's not directly related to science. It's the fact that uh, uh, you have use, useful information. It's basically objective information. And the other one is uh, just fake news and, and uh, distorted information and so on. It's, uh, the problem is that uh, uh, science is a victim of that, that kind of thing. We, we, we have seen that and we discussed that yesterday in the domain of health. Uh, in the domain, of course, also of in biology, you have also this kind of thing which happens. For example, some people are uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, discard uh, 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 genetically modified uh, organism in agriculture, even if it is known that it's very important for development of agriculture, for example, to develop plants which are resistant to insects and insecticides. Uh, so all this is, has to be controlled and it's very difficult. And, and in the domain of, of science in physics, I think, you have the same kind of uh, problems concerning uh, nuclear energy. Uh, a lot of, some people are against nuclear energy, which has some positive and negative aspects, but for ideological reasons. And we see that uh, also, and we have one, one has to be careful about that. Well, thank you again, Serge, so much for giving us this historical perspective with Future Outlook. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all of you for attending and for sharing this uh, wonderful moment with us. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Harosh, Ms. Parchman. I would, I would like to request you to be on the stage.
And I would also like to invite other distinguished guests for a group photo. Professor Ling San. Mrs. Claudine Harosh. <laughs> Professor Simon Redfern. Professor Sam Tsi Chen. <laughs> Professor Fan Antoine. And Professor Liu, uh, Liu Wenxian. Uh, audience, please be seated. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I now invite you to please take your seats. And I request Professor Ling San and Professor Harosh to be on the stage. Uh, Professor Ling San, I request you to present a memento to Professor Harosh. Professor Ling San, Professor Harosh. Uh, this brings us to the end of the Nobel Prize Laureate Lecture by Professor Harosh. I would like to thank you all for your kind presence. Thank you everyone.